All right, welcome. We're uh, in chapter 11 today. We're starting a new unit. Um, this unit is a three chapter unit and it's going to focus on prisons, jails, some of the associate things. Um, obviously, we're transitioning from the end of the court unit, which was really talking about a lot of the concepts behind of it, but now we're really looking at the application. So um, obviously we have, as with most chapters, we're going to start off with our learning objectives. And again, these learning objectives are not particularly or directly critical for you to look at. Uh, they just give an overall uh, picture of what we're hoping to accomplish with you in this chapters, uh, primarily just our, our, our goals. But again, it's helpful to, to keep these in mind. It's certainly good to read them over so that um, you can uh, understand why we're teaching you what we're teaching you. Okay, so uh, as usual, I like to um, uh, start the lectures with asking a few questions. And, uh, you know, when I was doing this, one of the things I was trying to construct uh, was what's the popular image of prisons and jails and what shapes it. So I thought that um, I could start with something that's really part of the American consciousness, or I, I guess the Germans call it Zeitgeist, um, which is the Shawshank Redemption. Of course, that's somewhat generational. It may not be as much a part today as perhaps it once was. But um, how do you think that the popular image of jails came into existence? You know, what informs us as to what's in jail or what informs us as to what's in prison? Um, you know, I think for most of us uh, who lack direct experience being incarcerated, uh, and even those of us that have visited jails or um, have some familiarity like myself, you know, I think a lot of our, our, our notions are formed by movies like The Shawshank Redemption. Um, the next question I think that's fair to ask, having said, okay, this is where our ideas about jail come from, is what's it costing us and what is it worth? Um, so prisons, as we're going to see in a little bit, are kind of a creation of the modern world, certainly on the scale that we're practicing. So what alternatives do we have? Um, maybe we explore something like corporal punishment. Why is corporal punishment anathema? What was the process through which we arrived at the idea that corporal punishment was not a good idea? Um, Next question to keep in mind, do prisons actually prevent crime? If we're talking about deterrence, remember one of the four fundamental reasons for the criminal justice system is deterrence, um, do they really deter? Um, or do they actually create crime? I think that's something we can look at uh, when we start looking at recidivism rates. The final point, and this is something I think we as Americans tend to uh, suffer from, is a, a sort of xenophobia, a fear of the outside. Maybe that's overstating. I think it's more the just the assumption that very few rules from the outside apply to us and that while well, others certainly can learn from America's example, um, there's not much we can pick up from other countries. And I, I think that's an unfair approach. I think that there are things that other countries have done which can be very useful to us uh, to look at, particularly in the criminal justice field. And we'll We'll touch on a few of those. All right, having uh, started with that, uh, we do have micro lectures. So the first micro lecture, uh, 11.1, is the idea that prisons are dangerous places. So we'll, um, we'll talk a little bit about the problems of disease in prison, physical assault in prison, sexual assault in prison, we're going to mention these in this chapter, but I think a, a quick five-minute approach and some statistics might be helpful. Um, and how the dangerousness of prisons relates to what we're seeking to accomplish. All right. So starting off, like most things, I think it's fair to say that uh, if you want to know how you got someplace, you got to know where you came from. And that means taking a look at the history of prisons. So one of the things that uh, is surprising, uh, much like the police are a creation of the modern world, prisons are a creation of the modern world. Certainly there have been prisons in the past. Uh, they have existed. We, we have um, 
stories and details, uh, histories of people incarcerated for long periods of time, but that was more the exception to the rule. Um, the idea that you would spend the resources to incarcerate offenders um, was really not something that past societies did. They tended to focus on physical punishment. Capital punishment was very common in the past. Uh, but gradually that idea really kind of fell out of favor. And as this process is ongoing, and this is really the beginning of the Age of Enlightenment, um, around 1700, um, people began to ask about, well, what, what the, do prisons as an alternative or as the primary mechanism through which we punish make more sense? So we had prisons early in the 1700s. Now, they were different, again, than the prisons we tend to see today. Uh, first of all, um, prisoners had to pay for their own upkeep, something we've been reinstitution, reinstituting. Prisoners very often were held for debt. Um, now, theoretically, again, we abolished that, but again, that's made a bit of a comeback. Men and women were often housed together with their children. Uh, you had very large communal cells, the idea of these small cells that we kind of associate with prison, not something that necessarily existed on a wide scale. So, um, gradually, as America got its independence, um, different and right around the time of the American War of Independence, Revolutionary War, different political thinkers, different social thinkers began to approach prison. This is really the age of experimentation in all sorts of social fields. I mean, this is really the age where Thomas Jefferson can write the Declaration of Independence and the, uh, the other founding fathers can write the Constitution as experiments. Well, the same thing is kind of going on in the field of penology or the prisons. So uh, the first real reform effort we're going to see is the Walnut Street Prison slash jail. It kind of did both. It had its roots in a offshoot of Christianity called Quaker or the Society of Friends, more accurately. And the Quaker religion, uh, which um, I guess a sect is more an apt term for it, the Quakers uh, were basically pacifistic in nature. They didn't believe in violence. Um, they were not great believers in force. Um, so when prisons came about, when they had to wind up running prisons, because Quakers became a very significant segment of the population in Pennsylvania, um, they wanted to emphasize work and prayer, not punishment. So their prisons uh, initially, this Walnut Street Jail, um, was very unique in the world. First of all, prisoners lived and worked in near total isolation, not only from guards, but from each other. Um, there were some problems with this idea. The, the, the first problem is it showed very high levels of mental instability. And eventually it became exceedingly expensive to operate. Uh, after all, if you say, well, it's, I'm going to have 10 cells with one person in each, or one big cell with 10 people in it, it's cheaper to run the one big cell. So these prisons, the Walnut Street prison, was expensive. There is a picture of the old Walnut Street prison, uh, 1774. So you see it's right around the time of the American Revolution. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, um, I was in Philadelphia not too long ago. It's, parts of it are still there. It doesn't look quite the same. And if I'm not mistaken, you actually can spend the night there. Not something I did, but I believe that was an option for those of you a little bit bolder than I. Um, so what were some of the problems? Well, the Pennsylvania system that develops out of this Walnut State system still enforced uh, solitary confinement. Uh, they had more work. There was a little bit more contact. But again, solitary confinement led to significant issues of mental illness. And even though uh, the society at the time didn't understand medical mental illnesses very well. They, they could recognize where they were coming from, and it's pretty clear that they were being generated by this policy of incarceration. So the Pennsylvania system, which is really the first broad American system, um, is experimented with, and if you want some dates, let's just say uh, 
1780 to early 1800s. Um, and it's most of these systems we're talking about are named after a state or eventually, because several of them come out of New York, specific cities or, the, or towns where the uh, initial or you could say pilot prison is located. Um, so the next system uh, was the Auburn system. And this is uh, based on ideas that came about in Auburn in New York. So uh, how is it different? Well, um, there was more integration. The, the prisoners were integrated together. Uh, the silence was still enforced, but there wasn't as much solitary confinement. There was obedience to the rules. One of the things they started to do, and this is something you know, which, which seemed just instinctive for us to do, is they actually segregated um, offenders by what crime they committed. So murderers with murderers, rapists with rapists, uh, burglars with burglars. This is kind of the idea that, you know, you don't put someone who committed a less dangerous crime in with a really dangerous felon. It didn't make much sense to them. They also, this is where the old kind of old timey black and white striped uniform comes about uh, that you've probably seen in cartoons and stuff. Um, it's only for a short period of time. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's strange when you think about where these things come from. For example, I just learned not too long ago that prison guards didn't even have uniforms in the United States till the 1940s. So, you know, we tend to say, okay, you know, I'm thinking of a prison. There are guards walking around in uniforms. Yeah, in a few of them, but most of them, no. This is a picture of Auburn Prison. Um, pretty intimidating uh, looking place, um, mostly gone today, as I recall. We also begin to see a split at this point in the United States between the North and the South. Um, the Southern states were particularly opposed to a lot of these new th theories about crime and prison and jails. Um, so what the South tended to do, particularly from about 1860 onward, is they actually kind of leased out prisoners. And, and there's really no other way to think about this except basically a substitute for slavery. So if you needed lumber cut, you could go to the state of Georgia or North Carolina and you could say, I want uh, you know 40 male inmates that I can put in a labor camp in the uh, mountains or the swamps or, or someplace relatively isolated. I'll keep an eye on them. I'll pay for them. Um, and you give them to me and I'll use their labor. And that was done extensively in the South. It wasn't really done in the North. Uh, there was a little bit of it, but it wasn't certainly done on the scale that you saw it in the American South. Uh, what was going on in, up in New York? Well, the next system after the Auburn system, again, is a New York system, and it's called the Elmira system. So we've had the Pennsylvania system, the Auburn system, which lasts in, in the intermediate period, and now we're looking at the Auburn system. So um, this looks, it's called, was called the reformatory movement. It was developed by a man named Zebulon Brockway in Elmira, New York. And one of the things it started to do was to treat prisoners as individuals. Um, he definitely believed that you should reward good behavior, and in particular, and this was really part of something that was going on all across the, the world, you were going to allow people to get paroled under supervision, reward them for good behavior. Um, so this was a, uh, an innovative system that uh, really was put in place right at the end of the 19th century. Uh, there's uh, old Zebulon. You can see that He's got at least some uniforms for his guards. Um, gradually, uh, around about the end of the um, First World War and into the Second World War, um, people began to think of crime more as an illness, um, kind of in a medical sense. So the illness of crime had both a physical base, like we would think regular illnesses would, but also they started looking at genetic ideas behind it, psychological ideas behind it, and social ideas. And this really flew in the face of up and up till then what had really been the dominant theory, which again was free will, that criminals chose to commit crimes. You don't have to worry about their genetics. You don't have to worry about their 
their physical conditions or psychological conditions. It's just, why did Bob rob the bank? Bob chose to rob the bank. End of story. So the medical model came in um, trying to treat these inmates, but it had uh, less acceptance, uh, particularly as, as the, the North and the Southern systems began to merge again. There was a great deal of criticism of this, uh, this medical model, in, in particular because it didn't seem that even if we said there was an illness here that we had any tools to treat it. And in 1974, Robert Matt Martinson wrote a very important article. That article was What Works. Um, and again, it's a little bit more nuanced than this, but to simplify it, um, his answer was nothing works. That everything we've tried, um, work reform, parole, release, medical model, none of this seems to really stop or reform criminals. So the idea was, let's just make prison harsher. Let's make punishments longer. Let's make prisoners suffer. Um, so in a sense, you're, you're claiming that nothing works, but here's what I think will work. And we began to see the imposition of um, essentially a much stricter penal system as a substitute for uh, what had been experimented with say, from about 1925 to about 1965. Um, so if we look at the overall system today, you should be aware um, that the United States has a dual prison system. Uh, now, this is a parallel, really, of our court system. Obviously, there are state courts and there are federal courts. There are state police and there are federal police. Uh, the federal courts, uh, the federal police, really, run primarily by the Federal Bureau of Prisons, uh, really houses people who have broken federal law. Uh, states house people who have um, broken state law. So who goes to prison? And this is by a breakdown of crime. Now, the, the state population is of interest to us because this is the bulk of prisoners, but I think the federal prison is a bit of a surprise. If you look at the, the numbers here on the state prison, you'll notice that 53% are in there for some sort of violent crime. So that would be something like assault with a deadly weapon, or a rape, or a murder, uh, kidnapping, uh, a pretty serious crime. About 19% are in there for a property crime. That would be something like burglary or, or theft. About 16% are incarcerated for drugs, and about 11% are in there for a public order violation. That could be something like prostitution. Now flip that to the feds. The feds, 50% of their population is in there for drugs. And 36% is in for a public order offense. Not a violent crime, not even a property crime. That's only about 13% of the federal. So 86% of the federal prison population as of, I think it's just 2015, if I'm not mistaken, are in there for what we would say, not necessarily violent crime. Not nice people, but not necessarily violent crime. So who goes to prison? Here is an interesting breakdown. Um, if we look at the total population in the United States, uh, you'll notice that it's about 64% uh, white. It's about 16% Hispanic. It's about 12% black. 4% uh, Asian, and then they've got 3% other. If you look at the people who are incarcerated, uh, if we take whites, for example, whites are 34, uh, 36% of those incarcerated, but are 64% of the population, which means they are underrepresented in prison, um, almost by a factor of half. Uh, it's somewhat close to that. Um, on the other hand, African Americans, blacks, are 12% of the population, but 38% of the prison population, so they're represented three times as much. Now, obviously statistics can be used in a great number of ways, but you could understand this, and it would be a fair statement to say something like this. If you're white or if you're black, a black man is six times as likely to go to prison as a white man is to go to prison in the United States. And that's kind of a shocking statistic. The Latino Hispanics are closer in number, and the Asian statistics are pretty small, the other statistics. Um, 
And again, I wish someone would do a paper on the underrepresentation of Asian population and other populations. I think it'd be fascinating to uh, study something like that. But as far as I know, that's not widely done. We tend to focus on Latin, uh, black, and white populations because obviously they're the bulk. Um, so what's prison administration like? Well, all prison administrations have a mission to keep them in, keep them safe, keep them in line, keep them healthy, keep them busy. So you should be aware that there is always in every structure a formal and informal rules. Um, and you've probably been in organizations working at a job or something where someone says, okay, you know, this is what we supposedly do, but this is what you actually need to do. So what you're supposed to do is your formal organization. This is a hierarchy, which usually means a pyramid. At the top of the pyramid is the warden. Sometimes he is called the superintendent, um, but he is uh, basically the fellow in charge of the prison. Uh, he bears the, the burden of running it. Um, he organizes it. He supervises it. Custodial employees deal with the inmates, and they make up about half of the prison staff, but there's going to be a lot of support personnel. We'll talk about some of those in a little bit. Um, it's not always clear where people fit in the hierarchy of a formal prison administration, because they seem to... Um, they're not as straightforward, let me put it that way, I think that's a fair way to say it, as, say, a police hierarchy, where they've got very definite ranks and structure. Now, there are also some special prisons, and this is going to constitute a um, separate lecture, uh, micro lecture 11.2. Um, I'm going to focus there on the Guantanamo prison, uh, which we've been running in a uh, military base that we hold on the island of Cuba for the last 20 years. And um, that lecture, again, I'll just refer you to that. We'll take a look at it when it comes up. Okay, I did want to include some information on specifically on North Carolina. Um, so our prison, and, and I do want to mention this uh, for those of you assuming this uh, COVID-19 goes away, and perhaps you're listening to this a, a year from now, and you're probably saying, well, duh, it's, it's gone, or oh my God, are you insane? We're still under lockdown. Um, Hopefully, when uh, things settle down, we can go back to uh, our typical tours of central prison. This is something we do fairly often uh, we go on tours, and I think it's a really good way uh, to appreciate what prisons are like to be exposed to them firsthand. So there are about a thousand inmates in North Carolina Central Prison, which is located in Raleigh. It's uh, downtown Raleigh. Closest buildings to it would be the NC State and Pullen Park. There are 700 uh, full-time employees. Um, it costs us about $62 a day, and that number is a little old, or roughly $22,000 a year in direct costs to hold an inmate in there. Now, I say direct costs, but you need to add things in like, well, what does it cost you to build the prison? Uh, how long is the life of the prison? When do you have to rebuild the prison? I mean, there's a lot of things to look at, uh, but direct costs... 22000 a year. Um, if you wanted to add in indirect costs, like um, capital outlays, constructions, uh, things like that, that number will jump up uh, anywhere between ten dollars and $20,000 more. The initial structure of Central Prison was built in 1884, um, and it was rebuilt in the 1980s. Uh, the original building was built, uh, I believe, around the same time the Governor's Mansion was in Raleigh with convict labor. They were both built with convict labor. There are 384 single cells. It does have our death row. Again, that's something I think that's really good uh, for students to visit. We do, if it's not occupied, if no one's on death row, we do go there. Um, there is also a mental health facility. In fact, you could fairly say that Central has a kind of mini hospital in it. So sometimes you're going to have people sent to to Central, not because they're exceedingly dangerous or bad, but simply because they have some medical concerns that really only can be addressed um, at Central because they've got the most extensive uh, medical facilities available in the North Carolina Department of Corrections. 
Okay, this is a typical prison organization. And North Carolina's, depending on the prison, are somewhat similar. So you've got the warden here at the top. Again, he can be called something like the superintendent. Uh, titles are not terribly important. Then you've got at least a breakdown, and sometimes they're going to be called different things, but again, this is a typical chart. You've got a custody, which is about half of the people. You've got the management, you've got programs, uh, deputy wardens, and then you have industry and agriculture, which we'll, we'll touch on several times in this class. So the, the custody warden, that's what we tend to think of when we think of prisons. Uh, the guards the guard force, uh, training the guards, safety, prisoner discipline, investigation of problems, setting up visiting schedules, all that's something we do. However, um, even if you have an organization that has a task, you have to have something that keeps that organization organized, which is the management. So they do things like budgeting, paying the guards, accounting, spending the money, uh, buying food, uh, running warehouses, running commissaries, um, providing clothes, uh, taking care of maintenance of the grounds. Um, all of these are important things that uh, are done uh, by management. It also, but not always, tends to be the area of most rapid promotion. So you, it's not unusual to see both wardens and others come up out of the management section as opposed to custodial. It's kind of like the difference in most police hierarchies between line and staff. You then have program wardens, um, and these will do things like uh, religious services or overseeing volunteers, helping with recreation, uh, dealing with issues like at Central where it's a pretty important, uh, mental health, uh, medical services, treatment programs. The fourth one, and this is going to really vary dramatically from prison to prison, has to do with industry and agriculture. So you can have some prisons that have very extensive agricultural functions. Um, Louisiana, for example, operates Angola, which is a, a large prison. It's their maximum security prison, I believe, in uh, Louisiana. The Angola prison has a fairly extensive uh, farm program in which you employ people to work on farms. But prison uh, industry is also done. Um, you know, a large amount of uh, manufacturing for the American military for certain commodities are made in prisons. Okay, running a prison. There's no single best form of management because every prison is, is unique in its own way. If you're running a juvenile facility, I think you're going to have different challenges, different things to face than if you're running a women's prison. And a women's prison is going to be different from a men's prison. And then you might have a high number of geriatric prisoners, prisoners who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s. You might have um, different races, different uh, ethnic groups. Of course, you do want to get the prisoners to behave. Um, you want to maintain order inside the prison. Uh, of course, if you don't, uh, obviously prisoners can get hurt, um, but and some could escape, which would be a bad scenario. But also don't forget guards uh, or prison uh, correction officers, as they're more properly called, could be hurt. Amenities. Um, you know, if we go back to utilitarianism, there's really two ways to control people with the carrot or the stick. So one of the ways in which you can control, uh, maintain orders, feeds into it, is small comforts. Um, having a cantina or someplace where prisoners, if they behave, can get uh, small commodities like a transistor radio or um, uh, maybe cigarettes, uh, something like that. Uh, even candy bars or Coca-Cola. You also have uh, service services available, things like uh, helping prisoners get their GED or helping prisoners um, learn a valuable skill so they can be employed outside. Um, prisons tend to be classified, uh, although not exclusively, on the basis of um, uh, three criteria. One, uh, how serious was the crime you committed? Two, what's your risk of reoffending or of violent conduct? 
And three, what are your treatment needs? Now, generally, there are four levels of security, minimum, medium, maximum, and supermax. Now, not all states do this. Uh, North Carolina doesn't tend to use the term supermax, um, although you could argue that central prison is close to that in some ways. Um, but most prisoners are not held in the maximums and supermax. They're going to be held in some of the others. So let's talk about the top end before we get to what most are like. Okay, what's a supermax? Supermax is um, probably more commonly shown in, in media and TV and movies uh, than uh, is accurate. Certainly, the bulk of the population, prison population is not in supermaxes. Supermaxes have an extremely controlled environment. They operate in a perpetual state of lockdown. Um, very few freedoms, a lot of restrictions on the inmates. Um, inmates are in their quarters probably 23 hours a day. Maximum security prisons, and central prison would be a maximum, uh, the in inmates' lives are still programmed, often in a very militaristic fashion. They tend to um, not be pleasant places. Uh, they can be very difficult. There's less emphasis on reform and training and more emphasis on control. So if you have a murderer or a violent serial rapist, they're going to wind up in maximum security or supermax. Minimum security prisons and medium security prisons are where the bulk of prisoners are. So most of them will wind up in the most common type of prison is your medium security prison. And that's about 45% or almost half of everybody that goes to prison goes to medium. Um, they're going to be people who are less dangerous. So you may have someone who committed a crime of violence, but it won't be a murder or a rape. It might be something like an assault. A guy got into a fight. Um, they are less restrictive. There is more contact between inmates. Uh, most often, inmates are not held in separate cells, so they will have um, other roommates. Um, they will co-mingle with each other more. There's more educational and treatment opportunities. Um, now, about a fifth of all prisoners are held in minimum security prisons, and these are designed for inmates who are very low risk. So if you had um, someone who committed a, a crime that wasn't violent, so take uh, Paul Manafort or uh, any of the recent individuals um, incarcerated federally, um, you know, that were involved in running the Trump campaign. Um, or if we reach back, um, I'm trying to think of someone who's incarcerated in the Obama campaign. I can't off the top of my head, so let's just stick with Trump for a second. Um, these are low security risks. Oh, I'll give you an example of someone who's, who's not particularly dangerous. Bernie Madoff, who was the uh, greatest thief of all time, one could argue, stole billions of dollars, uh, is not a particularly dangerous person. He didn't use violence to do it. He used a Ponzi scheme. So we're not going to worry about him going out and uh, stabbing a little old lady or blowing up a bridge. So even though he committed a fairly heinous crime, you can put him in these minimum or medium security prisons. There don't tend to be armed guards in minimum security prisons. Inmates have more freedom to move about. Rehabilitation and privileges are very much there. It's much more a as opposed to the stick environment, it's much more the carrot environment. What can we do to fix them? What can we do to help them? Juveniles are far more likely to be in a minimum security prison than uh, senior prisoners. So, uh, now, there's still clear restrictions on your personal freedoms, and you are separated from the outside world. Um, but it's uh, less like a prison that we see in TVs and movies and um, more still, I would say, closer to that medical model we talked about a little earlier. Okay, uh, the increase in prison population. Um, in the 1980s, um, we really ratcheted up um, prison populations. Currently, there are 2.3 million people in jail, prison, juvenile facilities, or immigrant detention facilities, and that number is as of 2019. I do not have statistics yet for 2020. 
so why has there been this uh, skyrocketing in prison populations? Well, one of the things we did was we decided to punish more crimes with jail than with suspended sentences. So we, uh, some, some of this was interesting and I saw it. Um, and you might say, well, yeah, that's uh, the right thing to do. You might say, oh, no, that's a bad idea. Uh, a quick example here, and most people don't think about this, is drunk driving. Uh, when I first started practicing in 1980s, the stricter uh, idea that drunk driving was a very serious crime was just coming into play. Um, prior to this, uh, incarceration for drunk driving was relatively rare, particularly for any long periods of time. Uh, now, it's still not easy to go to jail uh, for a long period of time as a drunk driver, but it's a lot easier today than it ever was. Sentences are longer. Uh, one of the things that we've done is we've decided in the United States that um, if you have a longer sentence for a crime, that's better than a shorter sentence. That it, it accomplishes more or maybe balances the scale more. Uh, federal prisons are larger. They, the feds have locked up more people. Parole has started to disappear. Immigrants uh, are now routinely going to prison for immigration violations. And we are seeing more women incarcerated. So it's really been quite dramatic. Here is the explosion of the prison population. And you'll notice that uh, in, in millions, and if you controlled for population per 100,000, this number would be flat almost till 1980. And then starting in 1980, it just goes up like a rocket all the way through 2000, 2010. Um, such that there are, as I said, about 2.3 million Americans now incarcerated in the United States. North Carolina has seen a real increase too. Uh, again, this is the breakdown. Uh, state prisons in North Carolina, there's 36,000. Federal prisons, we've got 11,000 here. There's another 19 or 20,000 in our jails. Um, that number could be a little bit higher. Um, there's more, there's about an eight, another 80 or 90,000 that are on probation or parole in North Carolina. So it's a pretty significant number. Um, if we look at our incarceration rates, uh, this chart over here, you'll notice that they also have gone up. They have more than doubled or tripled. So we've gone from 200 to close to 400. We've gone from about 50 uh, to almost 200. There's really been a real increase in the percentage of people going to jail. Um, something that's kind of overlooked. So what's the cost? Um, the cost, um, there is, you have to look at federal, state, county, city levels. So the state alone spends more, the states in total spend more than $40 billion a year to operate their correctional systems. North Carolina's average cost, and remember, it's not just what's it costing you per day per inmate because there's costs for building prisons and maintaining prisons and uh, rebuilding prisons and doing all these types of things. It's now over 30,000 per inmate. So in 2016, one of the last times I could find a, a set budget for North Carolina, we're spending a little bit over a billion dollars uh, on our prison systems. To give you an idea of how different this is, uh, if you know, we're in some states, we're spending more on prisons in those states than on uh, college educations. Now, because this is so expensive, uh, states have been looking at a de-incarceration option. Um, so deinstitutionalization, deincarceration, something to cut costs by reducing inmate populations. So this looks at three strategies. One, Let's get nonviolent offenders out. That's why that one of those charts I showed you, there were not a lot of nonviolent offenders as a percentage in North Carolina prisons and in state prisons. Increasing the rate of release for nonviolent offenders. So we've, we've transitioned. It doesn't mean we're not punishing them. What it does mean is there's a lot more probation and parole going on uh, than otherwise decreasing rates of imprisonment for probation and parole violations. In 2011, uh, North Carolina really tried to limit, uh, in a reform bill, the continuing cycle of incarceration for 
failing probation and parole. So many states have adopted one or more of these. North Carolina's probably the biggest thing we did was the Justice Reinvent Reinvestment Act of 2011. So what's some of the negative impacts of all this? Uh, well, first of all, you have to think that about 3 million, 2.7, if you want closer numbers, minors in the United States have a parent that is in prison. And high rates in imprisonment are also linked to incidences of STDs and pregnancies of both inmates and of children of inmates. Uh, there is also the impact on the inmates themselves, the physical and mental health inmates. And again, uh, we could talk about increased rates of HIV infection among inmates, increased rates of hepatitis infection. Um, then there's the impact of addiction, unemployment, homelessness. And this tends to fall disproportionately among minorities in our society. One of the uh, biggest things that have probably in the last 20, almost 30 years, has been the rise of private prisons. This was the idea that companies, corporations, could come in and they could run the prisons. Uh, today there is about 130 private prisons in the United States. And the, the way they sold this idea was they said, look, let us run prisons for the state of, say, Wyoming. We can do it cheaper. There won't be as much red tape. It's going to be very competitive. Well, um, first of all, is it cheaper? We're not really finding their significant savings. Uh, we have to remember that if you have a prison that you're running that's being run by the state, that prison doesn't have to make a profit. But if a prison is being run by a private corporation, it has to make money. Um, so not only if it's if, if it's going to make money, it has to be more efficient or has to charge the state more money. Um, they claim there would be less red tape. Well, good and bad there. Less monitoring can lead to increased violence and abuse. Um, they also claimed it would be competitive. Now, that's true. Um, they have, private prisons tend to have, significantly lower salaries for corrections officers than public prisons. But that begs the question, you know, are you getting what you pay for? Um, if you want your uh, corrections officers to be uh, well-trained and efficient um, and compassionate, uh, if you pay them $10 an hour, $12 an hour versus $40 an hour, do you get a better person for $30 an hour than you do for 10 And if not, you know, that really flies in the face of the whole idea of capitalism in the first place. Um, so most private prisons are run by very large corporations. Uh, the promise, uh, this is really a micro lecture that um, we're going to look at if you want. The promise they would be flexible, cheaper, better. And we'll look at a few more of the actual statistics about the, the theory behind this in the actual practice. All right. Now we're going to transition from talking about prisons to jails, and as I've said before, this is something that even I do routinely. I misspeak or I speak inaccurately. I tend to use the term prison and jail interchangeably, and they're really not. Um, jails hold people for short periods of time. They hold people before trial, so they're pre-trial detention, and they hold people for um, people who've committed misdemeanors. The Daily jail population in the United States is about 750,000. Um, this is uh, this is not something that's as studied, I would say, as uh, prisons. In part because you've got a transitory population, you have a population coming in, uh, and a high degree of turnover. Um, it's also not typically funded by the state as much as by county governments. And again, they just don't tend to attract as much study. Uh, this means that jails tend to be overcrowded and tend to suffer some fairly dismal conditions. So here's a uh, contrasting, and I believe this is from your text, difference between prisons and jails. Uh, prisons are operated by the federal and state government. Jails are operated by cities 
counties, although North Carolina doesn't tend to have city jails. Um, prisons hold inmates who have, uh, may live quite far away before they were arrested. Generally, jails hold people from the local community. Prisons only are supposed to hold people who have been convicted of the crime, although in rare circumstances you can have people that haven't. Uh, jails hold people who are awaiting trial or have been convicted of very minor ones. Um, prisons hold those who've been convicted of serious offenses, usually offenses that call for punishments above a year. And it's usually called the felony line or the, the felony misdemeanor split where if you're convicted of a misdemeanor, you typically can't serve or won't serve more than a year, but felonies, you can serve more than a year. Uh, prisons tend to have rehabilitation and educational opportunities. Because they have a smaller budget and people aren't there that long, jails tend to lack those, uh, which is pretty interesting. So who's in jail? Uh, jail populations are overwhelmingly young, they're overwhelmingly male, and they're overwhelmingly adults. Um, they also tend to have more people convicted of nonviolent crimes. So a simple possession charge for uh, a drug uh, where there's no distribution and it's not a large amount, you typically would have someone in a jail. You also have pretrial detainees. These are people that have been arrested um, but are unable to post bail. They can't get the money together to get out of jail, so they're going to stay there until their trial. Um, we do have some inmates usually who are serving their misdemeanors. Now, most misdemeanors are served based on a day period, so it's a 30, 60, 90 day is a very common sentence. Um, other jail inmates, we can have probation parole violators. Uh, we can have those that are mentally ill. We can have juveniles. We can have immigration law violators. All those are part of the jail population. So who runs the jails? Um, there are about 3,300 jails in the United States. Uh, so in North Carolina, every county in North Carolina has a jail that it runs. From the biggest counties like Mecklenburg, that is hosting Charlotte's jails, to Wake, which is Raleigh's jails, um, to the smallest counties like Mitchell County up in uh, the mountains, to uh, small counties. They all operate at least one jail. Most of the jails are operated, as I said, at the county level by a sheriff. So in North Carolina, the sheriff is in charge of each jail. Uh, there can be problems. Um, there are very often are people in our jails that have mental illness problems, physical problems, substance abuse problems. You can very often arrest someone who is an addict, which leads to significant challenges. What do you do with someone who is an addict and is going through a physical withdrawal and needs medical treatment? Um, jails, uh, the jail overcrowding problem exacerbates a lot of these. It's a very stressful area. It tends to be violent and aggressive. Um, those jails that have the biggest problems tend to be the larger ones, the ones that are near heavily populated areas. As for the future of jails, uh, we are looking away at this sort of old fashioned, and you'll excuse my dated reference. Um, Andy Griffith type jails, you know, Mayberry RFD, where you had these open jail cells and there were three or four jail cells and big keys that, you know, are huge in size and these iron bars. Not to say that we're not still incarcerating people, but we are doing direct supervision approach jails. We're doing a much different structure of a jail. Um, and one of the things that is happening across penology, not just jails, is integrating the guards into more contact with inmates and people in jails and prisons. So if you go on our tour of Central, you'll walk through the prison population. Now you won't walk next to murderers and rapists, but you'll not walk next to people that committed fairly serious crimes. All right, on that note, uh, to cheer you up, if you ever take one of our tours, that's uh, right about at 50 minutes where I wanted to be. Uh, that is uh, chapter 11. We'll pick up with chapter 12. Whenever you're ready, just click the button.